Welcome to everyone who's here so far. Um, Kiora, today we're going to be talking about changes to the law um, in terms of citizenship and New Zealanders. Um, my name's Katie Wrigley. I'm a senior solicitor in the immigration team at Legal Aid. Um, and yeah, today we're going to be running through some of the changes. Um, just while everyone's getting settled, it might be good to see if you can have a look and find the chat function. Um, and if you're comfortable doing that, you could write, um, I guess, which country, uh, which Aboriginal country you're coming from today in terms of where you're attending it from. Um, you can also turn on the live transcript if you want to see uh, the transcript to have um, better access for you. We've got um, the chat will be where we'll be running the questions today. Um, so feel free to pop any, any questions in there as we go along. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm presenting from, which is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders of this land, both past and present. Um, and I'd like to extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present today. Um, so yeah, if, if you're able to find the chat and get it happening, if you wanted to um, type in the chat where you're coming from today, um, you'd be very welcome to do that so I can see where everyone's coming from. Nice. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the changes that have um, now been introduced at law in Australia affecting Australian citizenship for New Zealanders. Um, we're going to talk about just citizenship by itself, like the process, the cost, steps involved. Um, we're going to talk about access to social security for New Zealanders at the moment and also after the 1st of July this year, what will that look like? And we're going to run through, I guess, who can help clients who will be wanting advice about this um, or assistance with this service. Okay, so um, currently, <clears throat> if you come to Australia from New Zealand or really from any country, you, um, you first have to become a permanent resident of Australia and then qualify for citizenship is the way that most people become Australian citizens. So that involves four years lawful presence in Australia with 12 months as a permanent resident. Um, and the way you count that isn't over a long period of time, it's immediately before you apply. So that's just some background in terms of how citizenship works normally. Um, and New Zealanders aren't um, any special. Um, than any other nationality in that regard, because you have to, um, you know, first qualify for a permanent visa of some kind, a permanent residency visa, then be here for four years immediately before you apply with 12 months as a permanent resident. You can be outside. There are some exceptions for the 12 months in that four years. You could be um, outside from no more than three months in the 12 months that you're required to be here of 12 months PR and then you can apply for citizenship. So that's sort of currently the way that citizenship generally operates for those who are um, applying on the basis of conferral or, on, or being here because getting citizenship because they've been in Australia. Um, but the change to the law, which is hugely beneficial to New Zealanders, is that they've just got this determination that amends the citizenship regs um, which extends permanent residency to all New Zealand citizens holding the visa that they hold, the special category visa, um, and backdating the 12 month permanent residency requirement for eligibility for Australian citizenship. So under this determination, some New Zealand citizens will be eligible to apply for Australian citizenship from 1st of July, 2023. And under that, that change to the law, um, a SCV, which is special, um, category visa. Um, New Zealanders, everyone's special. So that's not a particular um, category of New Zealanders that that applies to. That's any New Zealand citizen coming through on a New Zealand passport is, is granted a special category visa without application. You don't get a copy of it. It's not held in your hot little hand. It's just the way that you enter Australia. So a SCB holder will have be taken to have become a permanent resident. And then there's various dates. So if you if you were granted your SCB before 1st of July, um, 2022, then that's the date that you were granted permanent residency. If you um, 
were granted an SCV, i.e. came to Australia for the first time between 1st of July 2022 and 30th of June 2023, then you became a permanent resident on the day you entered Australia, the day you were granted that, that visa. Um, or if you come to Australia after 1st of July this year, then that's the day that you become a um, permanent resident for citizenship purposes. So it's fairly complicated when you look at it, but to simplify it, um, if you came to Australia before 1st of July last year, um, there's like we're going back in time in a um, time machine and you actually became a permanent resident last year. Um, if you had children in Australia born after that day that back in time you became a permanent resident, they automatically became citizens at birth in the same way that um, a child born to an Australian person onshore in Australia is a citizen at birth. Um, and then moving forward in terms of after 1st of July this year, what will things look like? Um, so New Zealanders will be defined as permanent residents backdated and will be able to apply for citizenship if they've been in Australia already for the, the right amount of time. Um, so I guess after 1st of July, what we're looking at is that if you're here in Australia, you actually became a permanent resident on 1st of July, 2022. So you can apply for citizenship straight away from the 1st of July this year, if you've been here for four years, or if you satisfy the being outside Australia rules. If you're arriving for the first time, you'll qualify for citizenship in four years time. Um, and then if you've been in and out or your dates are sort of somewhere between those two extremes, I think probably the best thing is if you seek legal advice on when would be the first date that you could apply. Um, all good so far, everyone following what that change will look like? Feel free to um, pop any questions in the chat as we're going along. Um, I guess in terms of another aspect that will arise, um, family members of New Zealanders. I've had a few people asking me, well, how will that affect people who are here as Australian, um, fam uh, as family members of a New Zealander? So at the moment, some children and partners of New Zealanders or ex-partners hold a 461 New Zealand family relationship visa. So they're not Australian. They're not New Zealand. New Zealander, there's something else. They're, they're English, they're Malaysian, they're another nationality. And because New Zealanders can stay in Australia indefinitely on their special category visa, the 444, um, there's this family member of a New Zealander visa that lasts for five years at a time that allows um, partners and children of New Zealanders to be here in Australia on, with them, um, that can be renewed every five years. Um, and I guess children born to New Zealanders in Australia are the other family members of New Zealanders that we see in Australia. And at the moment, they really only become a Australian citizen if the other parent is Australian or after 10 years residence in Australia on their 10th birthday. So they're, they're kind of some of the partners and children of New Zealanders and how the law treats them in terms of citizenship currently. Um, post 1st of July, in terms of what what we're looking at for how those people will be, will be treated. Um, I think the, um, you know, the family, the 461 visa holders here in Australia, um, they'll continue to hold those visas and they'll continue to be eligible for them every five years. Um, if the relationship is ongoing, perhaps if their partner becomes an Australian citizen, they could be sponsored for a partner visa on shore to become an Australian permanent resident, so they wouldn't have to renew this visa every five years. And then the other change, is my cat, is that children born to New Zealanders in Australia um, holding permanent residency at the time, which is that time machine that went back to July last year, will be taken to have become Australian citizens at birth and they can then apply for evidence of their citizenship. So they're not applying to become citizens, they, they already are citizens and they just need to evidence that. Um, and then I guess there's that, when did I become a permanent resident table to bear in mind in terms of whether the child was born, the dates that the child was born um, and so on. Um, question in the chat, by in and out, do you mean being overseas for more than 12 months over four years? I think, Look, there's no, I think um, generally the rule would be um, if you need something calculated, so um, in terms of when to contact legal aid. 
So in terms of just going back to the slide, if you've been in and out of Australia, seek legal advice. I think just in terms of, because it's based on where you've been in the four years immediately before citizenship application, there's those two rules about if you've been here, if you're here and you've been here for four years, that's pretty simple. If you're arriving now for the first time after 1st of July this year, that's pretty simple. In between, I guess, might just be good to just double check the, the first date you can apply, just because it is it does get a little bit hard to, to calculate. Um, uh, if you're not able to calculate it yourself, there is a calculator on the department's website, but just to be sure, it might be good to speak to an immigration lawyer to double check. Um, okay, so back to family members of New Zealanders. So I'll just do a case study too. It's always good to um, think about things in uh, with a person in mind rather than abstract. So example, Alana's here on a 600, a visitor visa. Her ex-partner and um, daughter are here in Australia holding the 444. That's the special category visa that every New Zealand citizen uh, is given when they come to Australia. The relationship's just broken down. She asks whether there's any option to apply for a 461 family relationship visa um, based on her relationship with her daughter, who's, the, who's also a 444 visa holder, um, because she's heard about this family relationship visa that she could hold. Um, and I guess this is something that we see for um, in the context of sometimes family violence. Um, but Unfortunately, the 461 is just there for the partner or children of the New Zealander. So in terms of how this would affect Alana, who's the ex-partner of a New Zealander, by the time she's contacted us, she's not the um, spouse or child of a New Zealander. So she's not eligible to apply for a 461 in that situation. She would have needed to have done that before the relationship broke down in order to access that 461 pathway. Um, Another example, um, T is a Vietnamese national who holds a 461 because of her relationship with a New Zealand man. There's been abuse. She's thinking of leaving that relationship. She asks whether she could stay in Australia if she leaves the relationship. And in, this is the kind of situation where you would be able to stay in Australia on that 461. So at the time of your visa application, you have to be a member of the family unit of a New Zealand citizen um, or you're in Australia, or you hold the 461, you're no longer a member of that family unit with the New Zealander that you were granted the 461, and you haven't become a member of the family unit of another person. So in this sort of instance, T could stay in Australia indefinitely, provided she doesn't form any new relationship that meets the level of a partner, and she renews that 461 every five years. Um, she'd need to have health insurance, that's a condition of the 461, but that 461 pathway, some people are in Australia on the basis of a relationship that was quite some time ago. Um, and then they can um, stay here as long as they continue to renew, um, renew that 461 every time. Um, Okie dokes. In terms of the citizenship process that New Zealanders who will be eligible to apply for citizenship after 1st of July or from their first date, um, lots of New Zealanders are contacting us at the moment at Legal Aid to say, well, how can I get ready for it? What, what's the process? What do I have to do? Because it's very different from when you just fly into Australia from New Zealand where there's no process. You don't have to, you've rarely dealt with the Department of Immigration in some situations. But um, there's three ways, I guess, or... Um, so you can do it through IMI account, which is the department's online platform. If you Google IMI account, create IMI account, you can pretty easily create an IMI account for yourself. Um, and then there's application, new application citizenship, and you can fill it in there, save it as a draft and submit things online. Um, you can't do that if you're getting, if you're um, eligible for any reduced fees, you have to use the paper forms if you're doing a discounted fee. Um, the two forms, there's two forms, it's usually the 1300T paper form, that's for general eligibility for people who have um, eligible by conferral, you're getting citizenship based on being here a length of time, um, or there's the um, other form, which is if you're over 60 years of age, claiming incapacity, so I can't sit the citizenship test because of my medical condition, um, and so you really have to choose your form early, 
um, as it, as the you can't swap over once you've once you've chosen. So if you're not sure about the incapacity issue and whether your medical situation in would allow you not to do the citizenship test, um, contact legal aid or get some advice about that. Um, the documents that are required for a citizenship application, um, I'll just go through them because they're listed on the form, but it can be a bit of um, work collecting all of these documents. Um, the department will need a current document with your photo on it and signature. So two documents that do that would be your Australian driver's licence or a New Zealand passport. Um, the Evidence of your residential address is another document that's required, a bill, um, a bank statement posted to your residential address in Australia, a lease rates notice. Um, so that's something that you'll need that's fairly uh, to, to prove, I guess, where you're living. Um, evidence of your identity in the community. So that's a photograph of you that's no more than six months old, which an Australian citizen who's from a list of set professions like your doctor, your dentist, justice of the peace, a nurse, pharmacist, physio, psychologist, or a teacher. If someone's known you for more than six months of those professions, they then can sign to confirm that that's your photo. Um, if you're applying through IMI account online, you'll need to upload a special form about that. And if you're applying through the paper forms, then there's a section of the form that you take to that professional person with your photo that they then execute. Um, the other document you need generally is police clearance certificates for any country where you've spent more than 12 months since the age of 18, which often is New Zealand um, and Australia. It could be another country, but they're the sorts of two police clearance certificates that you may need to provide as part of a document collection to get everything ready. Um, let me just see. The forms are available online. Yes, they're in their department's um, website. You can download those forms from their website. Um, or if you're doing the online IMI account application, then it's it's by creating an IMI account and, and submitting a new application in there. The citizenship test. So as well as collecting documents, if you're under 60 years of age, you can start studying for the citizenship test. The contents of the test are publicly available. They're in the Our Common Bond booklet, which you can access online. Um, if you can't do the test due to a disability or a long-term medical condition, please seek legal advice from Legal Aid. Um, we'd be happy to give you advice about, you know, the sorts of documents you would likely need from your specialist and your doctors in order to have the department accept that you don't have to do the test. Have a go in the chat. Um, have a try at a section of the test. So question one, which of these statements about voting in Australian elections is correct? A, people are free and safe to vote for any candidate. B, voting is by a show of hands. C, people must write their name on their vote. A, oh, nailing it. Yep, you could all be citizens. Um, question two, what is the name of the legal document that sets out the basic rules for the government of Australia? A, the Australian Federation. B, the Australian Commonwealth. C, the Australian Constitution. C, C, nice, Constitution, nailing it. That's correct. You could all pass it. Which arm, question three, of government has the power to interpret and apply laws? A, legislative. B, executive. C, judicial. Interpret and apply. Nice. C, C, they're coming through. C, yes. Judicial. Perfect. So you're all now officially Australian citizens. <laughs> Um, but that's an example of the kinds of questions which, you know, can be hard for someone if, it, if they have to sit the test in English, um, but everything is in the book that's in the test. You can, when you fill out the form, yeah, in terms of um, the, I saw someone mentioning over 60, yeah, if you're, if you're over 60, you're not required to sit the test. So if um, that's always something that if someone's close, they might like to wait for that. Um, otherwise, a person's not required to sit the citizenship test if they 
have a permanent or enduring or men, uh, physical or mental incapacity at the time they made the citizenship application. Um, that means that the person's not capable of understanding the nature of the application at that time. That's a pretty hard high bar there that you don't even understand what it is to become a, an Australian citizen or that means that the person is not capable of demonstrating a basic knowledge of the English language um, requirements at the, at the time. So you can't learn English because of their permanent physical or mental incapacity, um, is not capable of demonstrating an adequate knowledge of Australia and of the responsibilities and privileges of Australian citizenship at that time. So normally um, the, the last to those number two and number three are the ones that people would be successful in getting an, an, an exemption from the requirement to sit the test on the basis of. Um, but they really, they do require medical evidence about that and normally medical evidence from the specialist. And it has to address those two issues. It, it can't just say this person has PTSD. It's got to say, and because of that, they're not capable of and one of those things. Um, if you're not quite at that level of having specialists certify that you're not capable of um, uh, learning English or, or doing the test, you can ask for help for um, the computers. Um, so if you've got low computer skills, you can have um, headsets for audio. If you can't read English, you can choose to listen to the questions. You can ask for 90 minutes rather than 45 minutes to complete the test. Um, if you have ask for it in the form when you tick, do you need help? Um, or done 400 hours of English language tuition, or you've got an impairment at the time that means you need help. So if you're not quite at the level that we sort of just covered of getting a permanent um, or enduring physical or mental incapacity, then by all means ask for help. And as I say, if you're not sure, um, uh, then uh, contact Legal Aid for some advice. What if I've got a criminal record? So what if when you get your police checks back from New Zealand or Australia, um, it shows up that you've been convicted of something? So the department must refuse an application for citizenship, um, which is made by someone with a current criminal charge or a criminal appeal ongoing. So they must also refuse the application if the applicant is currently in prison or within two years of being in prison after what's known as a serious prison sentence, meaning a sentence of imprisonment with a period for, of at least 12 months. Or they must refuse it if you're currently on parole or you've got conditions on your behaviour issued by a court. So if that's you, you won't be able to sit the citizenship, won't be able to lodge your application for citizenship yet because it must be refused by the department currently. Um, but also, if you have a criminal record, at really at any point in your past, the department may refuse your citizenship application if they think you are not of good character. Um, what does that mean in terms of who's of good character and who's not? Um, it's a holistic test that they look at. So it's your behaviour as a whole. Um, if what's on your criminal record is a certain kind of offence, you might like to consider doing, you know, producing some evidence of any rehabilitation efforts you've done or any um, factors that are now supportive factors that means you're no longer a risk to the Australian community of committing that kind of offence in the future. So depending on how um, recent that offence is, what's happened since then, um, I guess seek legal advice about the sorts of documents or the sorts of things that you could present as part of your citizenship application. If it's not one of those blanket bans where they must refuse you, if it's more like they may refuse you, maybe speak to a lawyer about how to best frame that with the department to ensure that that application has the best chance of success. Um, just as we're going along, how does it work with being a New Zealand citizenship and having Australian citizenship? You can do both, is my understanding. So dual nationality is permitted by Australia and New Zealand. Um, and in terms of the old system, um, uh, New Zealanders, we'll come to that in, in a moment in terms of the protected ones who arrived before 2001. Um, if someone's been here for 13 years and goes back to New Zealand this month, June, for a period of time to visit family, will they be able to come back as a permanent resident? Um, yes, so I guess the date that they would be granted that would be when they come back. 
um, so is my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but so that would mean that they would then need to, they could, um, the periods that they'd previously been in Australia would, would count as long as they hadn't been outside Australia for more than 12 months. So that period of that they go back to New Zealand could be up to 12 months, but no longer for them to qualify at the first possible time. Um, and then 12 months from the day they come back would be when they would first meet that 12 months of, of PR. Whereas if they stayed here, it would probably be granted in July this year. Um, so I guess that if people are wanting to access citizenship as soon as possible, um, that's, I guess, something to calculate for yourself based on time in and out of Australia. Um, how much does it cost? How long will it take is the questions that we're getting asked by New Zealanders. Um, the current cost is $490 for most New Zealanders to become a citizen. Um, and then if you are asking for evidence of your baby that was born in Australia, um, of their citizenship, um, it costs $240 for the certificate evidencing citizenship from 1st of July. So the current processing times in terms of they publish them on the department's website, so you can always have a look and see how long citizenship taking right now. Um, and yeah, generally they say 50% processed within, you know, um, from date of application to decision, six months, 75% processed in eight months, 90% processed in 11 months, that's from date of application to decision. But if you're looking at from date of application to ceremony, um, then it's like, you know, around 15 months on average is how I would read those, those figures. So it's not as soon as you apply. I guess as soon as in terms of what you could do to try and make sure it's not as one of the longer end of the spectrum is front load it, make sure everything's correct, make sure everything's with the application from the get go. So as soon as it reaches an officer, they can pro process it um, quickly and without further delays. Um, question, how does a person get their police clearance from multiple countries? The department publish that information on their website. So if you go to police clearances, um, there's a link there. Um, about how to get it or how to get the right, the, the kind of document that the department wants from each country and how to apply if you're a resident um, outside of the country or a citizen outside the country or what your situation is. So non-resident, non-present, um, non um, and they've sort of got little sections. I can um, send around a link to that, that document. But in terms of the police clearance, you sort of need to check what which what kind of document it is with the department before you before you go. And there is a short information um, there for each country. When I said most New Zealanders have to pay 490, um, who doesn't? People often ask me. There's, I've said out there, you know, the exempt, the fee reductions. Um, unfortunately, I don't think many New Zealanders will be able to access these because you really have to hold a pensioner concession card, which not many New Zealanders in Australia currently hold because they need to have either been um, one of the protected pre-2001 New Zealanders or to have received Centrelink under the international agreement. Otherwise, New Zealanders currently aren't eligible for that pensioner concession card. And there's no discounts if you hold a healthcare card, um, which is what many New Zealanders hold as their uh, discount card from Centrelink. So, I mean, generally, uh, most people who will be applying will need to um, spend the $490, no discounts. Centrelink, we've had a question about eligibility for Centrelink, so let's get into that. Um, so just an overall, while you're waiting, like until you become a citizen, temporary visa holders, which is what the 444 is, although you can stay here indefinitely, um, it's still regarded as a temporary visa, not normally eligible for Centrelink payments on an ongoing basis. Permanent visas, like permanent residents, normally there's a four-year wait for allowances and a 10-year wait for pensions in terms of those newly arrived resident waiting period or qualifying residents um, periods. Citizenship, no residential waiting period. So you can just march right in and get straight onto Centrelink. Um, so that's really good news for New Zealanders who'll be able to, once they become a citizen, they'll be able to receive Centrelink without a wait time. Let's just step back a bit about New Zealanders currently in Australia. What can they do? What can they not do? So on a 444 visa um, in Australia, a New Zealander can get Medicare. They can work, they can stay here as long as they like, 
as long as their visa is not cancelled. They can come and go between New Zealand and Australia. They can apply for visas here, including permanent visas if they're qualified, but there hasn't traditionally been a specific pathway outside of on the basis of employment, income, partners, and so on for permanent visas for New Zealanders. They could sponsor their immediate family, um, their spouse, their child for a 461 visa. Um, but on the 444 visa, a New Zealand citizen here can't get most social security. So you can't sort of get ongoing payments of most social security payments, can't vote, can't stay here. If their visa is cancelled, they're removed from Australia to New Zealand. Previous, well, current, previous to this amendment to the law, you couldn't become a citizen unless you first qualified for a permanent visa of some kind, can't access the NDIS, can't sponsor relatives for permanent visas that require the sponsor to be a permanent resident. Um, and there's one group of people who are the exception, which is that if you came before 26th of February 2001, you still hold the same number of visa. So it's still a 444 visa, but you're protected. You're an eligible um, New Zealander. So in that case, you can get most social security you can become a citizen, you can access the NDIS and you can sponsor relatives for permanent visas. So that's the benefits of being one of those older uh, protected visa holders. Um, there was a question about how, does the, how do these changes affect these protected New Zealanders? Um, they can currently become a citizen. They don't have to wait for 1st of July. Um, so they're already eligible on the basis of um, permanent residency. Um, because that there's already a, a provision in the law to provide that they are treated as permanent residents for a citizenship application. So provided they've spent the amount of time here, they could lodge the application now. Um, and I guess in terms of, well, how do I know if I'm a special um, protected 444 visa holder? I, I think Centrelink's the best organisation at the moment to give you the certificate that you need to attach to the um, citizenship application form because they asked for a, Cent a Centrelink certificate. Um, there are some exceptions with Centrelink. So some temporary visa holders can receive Centrelink payments. So um, the temporary partner visa holders, um, temporary protection visa holders, shared visa holders, criminal justice stay visa holders, they could receive special benefit if there's been a substantial change in circumstances beyond their control. Um, New Zealanders are a bit of an exception, we'll come to that. Um, people with an Australian citizen child can receive special benefit in the child's name. So they're just some of the ones to watch out for around the outskirts of that general rule that temporary visa holders can't receive Centrelink payments. Um, because I guess given that we've just sort of learned that 15 months might be a long time to wait, it might be good to prick your ears up to, is this a person with an Australian child? Could they get the, the special benefit? Um, New Zealanders currently are able to receive healthcare card or a seniors card, but no pension and concession card. Um, they could receive a one month, one off six month payment of job seeker or youth allowance, but that's after 10 years in Australia. So they have to have been here for 10 years and then they can get six months of payments. Um, and they're the same as a permanent resident if they're protected. So that's the key date of the 26th of February, 2001. Um, New Zealanders caring for a child, including a New Zealand citizen child, could receive FTB, family tax benefit, childcare subsidy. Um, and the other exception would be if they could receive, you know, the age pension or DSP under the international agreement, um, which I would say if you're wanting advice about that, probably speak to um, either welfare rights or legal aid social security team about whether a person would be eligible to receive those payments under the international agreement. But that's sort of a run of what New Zealanders currently could get if they're not, um, if before they go on to um, become Australian citizens. Okay, study. Jerry is 30 years of age and came to Australia for the first time from New Zealand in 2017. She asked you, am I special? Am I protected? Am I eligible? She's heard these words used about New Zealanders, doesn't know what, what they mean. What visa would she hold and how long can she stay in Australia? 
Um, can she access any Australian social security payments? Any ideas? Four, four, four is the visa that she holds. Very good, special category visa. She's special, but not protected, perfect. She'd be eligible for citizenship after 1st of July. Um, yep. So, um, yeah, that's exactly right. So, um, as we've discussed, special category visa is the 444 that's granted to a New Zealand citizen when they come to Australia. So if she came in 2017, that's the visa she holds. She didn't come before. 2001, so she's not a protected, she's not an eligible. So protected and eligible, they're the words used by Centrelink, they're the words used by um, the Department of Immigration to distinguish people who arrived before 2001. Um, the visa she holds is that special category visa, the normal one. She can stay in Australia indefinitely. Um, and I guess because she's regarded as a temporary resident, because that's what the 444 is, it's a temporary visa, she can access Medicare, she can get a healthcare card. Um, once she's been here 10 years, which is 2027, that's when she'd be first eligible for her six months payments of job seeker, but no ongoing social security payments. But after 1st of July, she could apply for Australian citizenship. And then once her citizenship is granted, she could then apply for um, job seeker to receive on an ongoing basis, not just a one-off six month payment. NDIS and housing. So, I mean, I'm in New South Wales, I'm not sure if people are attending from outside Australia, from other states, but um, NDIS, which is national, you must be an Australian permanent resident, you must be an Australian citizen, or you must be a protected New Zealander. So this is really good news for New Zealanders who haven't been able to access the NDIS because there's a lot who didn't arrive before 2001 um, and have been excluded from the scheme. Whereas after they obtain Australian citizenship, they will be able to um, not be residentially barred from the NDIS. Um, same with Department of Housing. You must be a permanent resident, Australian citizen or protected New Zealander currently for New South Wales. Um, but if you become an Australian citizen, then that doesn't bar you from applying for Department of Housing. Who can help? Um, so there's us, the Legal Aid Government Law Team. We give advice on immigration, social security, and DIS. Um, there's advice on Centrelink eligibility also from the Welfare Rights Centre. There's um, Red Cross are doing financial assessments of help for victims of family violence on temporary visas. That includes New Zealanders. Um, people have been able to access three grand under that financial scheme. Um, there's advice also on immigration and citizenship from IARC. I think they're running an information session as well tomorrow. Um, and they're advising a lot of New Zealanders at the moment too. So don't forget about them. Um, NDIS or... Um, public housing, I think generally you'd need to start with the organisation itself to make the request, to contact Department of Housing, contact the agency, make an access request, and then legal aid steps in at the, if, if you're having refusal issues or on the appeal. So I would say if you're wanting to contact someone about eligibility, start with the organisation itself and then contact legal aid if there's been an issue with it. And our immigration team, we have face-to-face -face appointments at various locations around Western Sydney. Um, so we are at Liverpool at the Western Sydney Migrant Resource Centre. We're at Auburn at Accessible Diversity Services. We're at Mount Druitt at Sid West. And we're at Fairfield at CORE. So if someone could, has, has I mean, we don't, I don't think many services have um, capacity to fill out forms face-to-face -face with New Zealanders with this new change. Generally, we would be asking people to have a go filling the form out as best they can, collect the documents, and then contact us for an appointment to have their forms checked before they're submitted to the department. Questions? Um, I'm just going to go back over the chat to see what I've missed. Um, in terms of uh, 
Uh, okay, so there's been a question, is, that, is it a requirement to show all employment study from birth and all dates of birth from family, siblings, and 10 years of travel outside Australia? The form will guide you on the questions, the citizenship form. Um, and if you're doing it online, it's quite unforgiving in terms of requiring dates um, for, uh, for things. So I would, I would say have a look at the form itself and see what you're dealing with, whether it's because there are the two different forms are different. Um, and if you don't know a date of birth, you can always just use the paper form and give as much detail as you do know. There is the 10 years of travel. If you don't know when you've been in Australia and when you've been outside Australia, you can apply for your international um, travel, your travel movement records with the Department of Immigration. Um, so they know <laughs> when you've been in and out of Australia. Um, and so they can, you know, you can get the dates from that request, which is via the department. Um, and that may help you, you know, get that sorted. So now might be a good time to apply for that if you feel that you, you're going to have trouble remembering dates of, of what happened when. Um, and I have had people say, well, how do I show evidence of my visa or how do I show that I was living and resident in Australia? There's no requirement to show that you, um, to document your residence in Australia. You just have to be lawfully present here to qualify. So just the fact of being in Australia, you don't have to show any particular um, settling down or nesting or anything. It's just the fact that you're present in Australia on a visa. Um, any period that you didn't hold a visa will restart that count again. So if you had a visa cancelled, I would say seek legal advice. Um, and let me see. If you're finding the form unforgiving, I would say make an appointment with as much as you've got done and then contact Legal Aid for to have an immigration lawyer check the form before submission. So, yes, we're keen to check people's forms once they've collected their documents and got it together. Um, and then we can run our eye over it and see what's missing and help them fill in the blanks. International agreement in one sentence. Oh, I'll try. It might be a long one. Um, so you can get the age pension under the international agreement if you have been living in Australia for 26 weeks, have lived in Australia for one year since age 20, have 10 years working age residence from 20 to 65. So based on living in Australia, living in New Zealand, you might be able to qualify for the age pension that way. Um, disability support pension, yes, if you are severely disabled and have 10 years residence in Australia or New Zealand, severely disabled if um, you can't work within the next two years. And I think it's, it's even harsher than Australian DSP. You could be permanently blind, but otherwise, if it's not permanent blindness, you have to be unable to do work of eight hours or more for the next two years. So that's a pretty small eight hours or more a week um, is different to the Australian uh, DSP hours. Um, and carer payment could be under the international agreement if your partner's in receipt of DSP once you've done the two years newly arrived residence waiting period. So they're the sort of three payments you might be looking at under the international agreement. Sorry, Gary, that was a long sentence. But um, I think if you're in doubt, um, contact you know, Centrelink and say, I want to be assessed under the international agreement and they may be able to give you some more information. Can I grab the form names once more just to fill in in 1st of July. Let's go back to what those form names are. 1300 and 12 something something. Yeah, 1300T. And let's move my face out of the way. 1290. So the 1290 is if you're over 60 or if you are claiming incapacity, so no capacity to sit the citizenship test and you'll be getting information from your doctor to prove that. 1300T is if you're not claiming the incapacity and if you're um, uh, not, over, not over 60. Um, can you confirm if a person becomes a PR after 1st of July, they're then entitled to housing before becoming a citizen? Yeah, so for Department of Housing, it's just permanent residency or citizenship. So you, you can apply as soon as you become a permanent resident for, for public housing. Um, you don't need to wait for citizenship, but for um, 
Centrelink payments, if you become a permanent resident now, generally there's those residential waiting periods you'd be expected to serve until you become a citizen and then you're exempt from those residential waiting, waiting periods. Um, yes, I'll send around a copy of the slides to participants. Um, I'll see if I've missed any others. For being able to sponsor a spouse, what's the criteria? Look, it's different if you're doing the New Zealand family relationship visa compared to doing a partner visa application. I mean, the, for the partner visa application, it's very strict definition that looks at um, the four pillars. It's got to look at the social aspects of the relationship, the nature of the commitment, nature of the household and financial aspects. Um, so you really have quite a lot of evidence that you have to show joint bank statements or how you structure things financially, that you're known to family and friends as a couple, um, that you're in a mutually exclusive relationship on an ongoing, on you know, indefinite basis, um, that you your relationship, I guess, looks and sounds like a relationship in terms of those four aspects. But for the 461, four, there's no specific definition like that. So it's generally a partner and it's up to you to demonstrate in, in what way that is. So normally you'd be living together, normally it would be um, um, adopting a similar definition as partner for a partner visa application, but it's not, it's not set out in writing that you have to have lived together for 12 months to, to become de facto like it is for a partner visa. So I think it depends which visa you're applying for. Um, but for the 461, sometimes people say, well, you know, for those people who are here on that family, visa but on the basis of their ex-partner how can I stay here indefinitely not becoming re not entering into not becoming a member of the family unit of someone new and I guess it's it's a, a distinction between you know a girlfriend girlfriend or boyfriend um, girlfriend relationship versus a de facto um, where you're living together as partners um, is how the department tends to tends to distinguish them there are some questions in the q a I'll have a look in there um, for the NDIS, are you a permanent resident from 1st of July and therefore qualify? Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that one. Yeah, and it's only a PR for citizenship purposes, unfortunately, because they've amended the Citizenship Act to make you a PR, but I don't think they've amended the NDIS Act. So, no, I think you have to first get citizenship is how I read that one. Should you provide the police clearance documents when you apply or wait till they're requested? Um, I guess that's a choice. They do cost money. So if you're wanting to keep it as cheap as possible, you might wait to be asked because they do expire after a period of time. On the other hand, if you're wanting to access the citizenship as soon as physically possible and expense isn't an issue, then you might want to do it when you apply so that everything's ready. Um, Oh, if you're under 18 and applying independent from your family, do you still need to provide police clearance certificates you've lived in for over 12 months? My experience is they don't require them for people under 18. So it's generally only people over 18 are required to provide the police clearance certificates for um, countries they've lived in for over 12 months. And sometimes they can also request a Form 80 uh, for people who are over 18 in terms of that's more of a... Um, character security type that's got questions like have you served in the military have you done military service those kinds of when they want to know more about um, something from you they can ask that an applicant over 18 fill out form 80 and do the police clearances for countries they've lived I haven't seen people under 18 being requested to do that um, I think I've addressed the old system uh, over 20 years on, on a non-protected. So she arrived when she was 13 years old. So she's a non-protected, sorry, I'm answering Mark Lowe's question. I've assisted in the past a member of the community that's been in Australia for 20 years on a non-protected SCB. She arrived when she was 13 as she was on a non-protected. Would these changes be applicable to her? Yes. Yes. So she would be determined as becoming a PR back in time in July last year and should be eligible to apply for Australian citizenship. Hopefully she is older now because I guess if you are applying um, and uh, the department do have get a bit funny about independent child applications so I think if you're um, a child applying by yourself you might want to speak to us at Legal Aid about whether or not there's um, uh, any going to be any issues for you because they normally like to see evidence that the other parent 
um, consents to the application and they don't tend to grant citizenship for children um, unless there's a parent also becoming citizenship. Um, yes, Roxana has clarified, there's no formal good character test for applicants under 18, so they shouldn't be required to provide those police clearance certificates. Where have I moved my, I've got my chat open, but not my, um, I think I've moved my Q&A. Let me see where that went. Um, so I'll just go back to, I think there's a few questions about when you become a PR. And I'll just go back to that sort of ugly, complicated slide that sets it out. There it was. So you're becoming, you're taken to have become a permanent resident, but only for citizenship purposes, if that makes sense. So you're not actually a PR automatically and you're not actually a citizenship, a citizen automatically. You still have to go through this process of applying for citizenship. So um, currently there, you can apply for PR as a New Zealander in Australia or from New Zealand, um, but you have to qualify for a visa of some kind. So there are lots of New Zealanders who in the past have become Australian permanent residents through their employer nomination or their work or their skills or by marrying an Australian or a relationship with an Australian. But unless you qualify for some existing permanent residency pathway, um, you don't become a permanent resident actually. This is just a pathway to then become an Australian citizen. So. Um, New Zealanders arriving after the magical date, which is uh, 1st of July this year, won't automatically touch down as citizens. They have to still apply for citizenship, but they will touch down um, as being regarded as permanent residents for the purposes of citizenship. Um, let me have a look. I think I've answered most of them. Paula, have I missed anything? Not sure. I think the only thing I was going to um, let you know about was the character requirements for visas link, um, just in terms of how you can apply for the um, police certificates. So I'll put the link in the chat, but pretty much if you um, go to this sort of section of the department's websites and scroll down to police certificates, it takes you to, um, you can see how to apply for an overseas police certificate in the relevant countries. And then you click on that and scroll down, find your country, and it will take you to a short um, excerpt of what the certificate is called and how you can go about doing it. But I think basically the message is, um, you know, this change is um, hugely beneficial for New Zealanders. Um, and need, people need to get on it and to get their documents ready and um, apply for Australian citizenship because then they'd be able to access supports in Australia. You know, it's pretty difficult being here in Australia without access to those supports. Um, so um, yeah, I think um, I would encourage anyone contacting New Zealanders or New Zealanders doing it rough in Australia to make contact with services, make contact with legal aid, start to collect as many documents as they can, you know, passports, birth certificates, bills, um, evidence of relation, evidence of your identity in the community, pol um, police certificates. If At least if someone's got those documents, I think it'll be um, quite a, a beneficial appointment with legal aid rather than just coming for advice about the changes and what they mean. Um, and yeah, I, I guess, um, let me just see. What other questions have we got? Um, will the department assess the application at the time of submission? For example, if you apply on 1st of July, then travel and subsequent period of travel won't count towards the 12 months. It's immediately before application that you must meet these residence requirements. So you can't bank up four years over a 20 year period and you can't sort of bank up. So it's, it's immediately before you apply that you have to have racked up the four years pre lawful presence and the 12 months as a PR. 
Um, and if you're going to be outside Australia when it's being processed, there's a question on the form that says, do you intend to be outside Australia for any period of time during, you know, in the next period of time, you have to tick what dates you're going to be outside. Um, so generally you can't have it approved while you're outside Australia. So you need to, um, but you already have to have met that before you apply it doesn't you can't sort of build it on during the delays in processing so I guess if you're not sure if you've got that four years and the 12 months seek advice um, and determine the first possible date you can apply for citizenship and sometimes people contact us saying look I'm planning to do this how would that affect my, the first date of eligibility for citizenship and that's something we're always happy to answer Paula has pointed out people are welcome to email the CLE branch if there are any questions unanswered and we can pass them on and then maybe I can include those on, um, on the handout with the slides. Um, ooh, there's the form, oh nice. Uh, thank you, Stella. So that's a link to where you can find the PDF of the form that most New Zealanders will be using to apply um, unless they're claiming that uh, exemption from the test. So if you wanted to have a look and see, well, what details do I need to find out from my family about um, you know, who's in my family and the dates that I was overseas and my address, you can have a look, go through the form, see which areas you're likely to have problems with, and then fill it in as best you can and make an appointment to come and see us and have someone uh, help you out with those tricky questions. I think that might be about it. Does any last chance for any questions in the chat? Going, going, gone. Um, okay, well, we might leave it there. Um, thanks so much for asking all the tricky questions. That was quite useful to help work out what's going on. Um, and yeah, if you have if you have a question, if you have a um, a client you're wondering about in terms of um, you know how legal aid can help them or um, someone that's having trouble connecting with services. I mean, in terms of referring people to legal aid, there's, there's um, government law team. So there's our phone number there. Um, there's our email for the LSOs, our legal support officers. If you can't get through, because we're often quite shockers on the phones, you could call Law Access um, and then they could put it through an intake queue to get to our team. Or you could contact any legal aid office and the matter will come to us. So there's really no wrong door to get to us. Um, but I'll just leave those contact points and they'll go out in the slides. If you have a client that you want to refer to us, uh, get in touch. All right. Thanks, everyone.